Your business needs help. 56.1 million employees are employed by small businesses in the United States, and 99% of all U.S. establishments are small businesses under 250 employees. That means that your business should be listening to the only podcast dedicated to small business success. That's Growth Success Radio, growthsuccessradio.com. Welcome to this week's episode of Growth Success Radio. Good morning and welcome to another episode, episode number 27 of Growth Success Radio. I'm one of your co-hosts, Scott Gumbar. I am the owner of Scott Gumbar Digital Marketing Agency. Uh, to my right, as I'm looking at this, is Eugene Resnitsky. Eugene, tell him you know, he's also a co-host, by the way. Yes, I'm, I'm as Scott said, Eugene Resnitsky. I am co-owner of Traeger Insurance Group. We are a uh, independent insurance agency based out of Meriden, Connecticut. And what independent means is we act similar to like a mortgage broker. So we take the client's information and we shop it out to the market to get them the best price for the most optimal coverage. My role within the agency is president of commercial lines. So my job is to grow, manage, and um, oversee the entire commercial lines division to help my clients cover the what ifs in life awesome as, and as i said i am a digital marker marketer who can't talk this morning uh and what that means is i yeah it's always a problem right we never we never have a show without a problem there um okay so what that means is i help you had is I help businesses find highly qualified clients using internet, things like Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so forth. Um, this week, we are joined by Dan Blanchard. Dan is a teacher in the public school system. He is an author, and he is a keynote speaker, and we're really excited to talk to him. But before we get to that, uh, Eugene. Oh, and yes. we are live. We are live every Friday at 10 a.m., right? Eastern. Um and if you want to listen to or watch, because we do both, we upload the video and the audio, watch past episodes or listen to past episodes, just visit growthsuccessradio.com. And uh, if you want to win a free T-shirt during this show, neither of you is eligible. If you want to win a free T-shirt during this show, just share the show link out on Twitter or Facebook with the hashtag success hack during the show. And uh, the person who does it the most wins that T-shirt. And uh, Eugene, yes. any, any exciting updates in the insurance world? Well, depending on your definition of exciting and insurance, generally don't go together. But um, there's a couple things that are happening. So I don't know if you guys know, there's most insurance companies are asking people to put the little telematic chips in the car where they track your driving and offer you a discount to have it, a potential future discount. So what they're doing now, and they're trying to roll it out more and more, is using that chip as first notice of loss. So that means when you get into an accident, instead of having to notify your agent or insurance company, the chip will automatically send a notification to the company saying, hey, client got into an accident, which would let the insurance company call you, send a tow truck, whatever they need to do. So it sounds great, but the problem I see with it is if it's a not at fault accident where you got rear-ended, that might cause you to make a claim under your own insurance, which would make your rates potentially higher in the future. It's always about the insurance companies getting their money, Eugene. Absolutely. So I have. That's some... why we have Bob Gould, right, to take it from him. That's right. I have some exciting updates in the social media world. Instagram is going to introduce an algorithm. I know that's going to excite people because Facebook did that a few years back and we saw people's uh, Facebook page traffic drop after that. 
So what do you think is going to happen to people's Instagram accounts? I wonder. And uh, we all know who owns Instagram, right? You. That's right. I own it. No, Facebook does. If I owned it, um, I probably wouldn't be doing the show right now. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, Facebook is going to start doing live TV. So their first show is going to be E! Entertainment, mm -hmm. e, I think. I don't know. ETV. Yeah. They're going to do 20-minute yep. shows on Facebook. So it's interesting. The cable industry takes another hit probably. Uh, and that's why they keep jacking up our... Uh, in our uh, internet rates mine is now at 80 dollars a month it's it's really great and then finally i just saw this morning tell me this isn't weird snapchat is buying bitstrip you guys remember bitstrip mm -hmm. they made those i uh, want to use the characters yeah that's what i was thinking they, they make those uh they make they turn you into a cartoon basically mm -hmm. so that's interesting I, I didn't even think bitstrip was still around because nobody uses it anymore they well, used it for like seven minutes and then they stopped it was cool, and then you're like, you're like, all right, this is boring. That's right. Um, um, and I have another update. Just, they, just kind of, they, they just texted you? No, you reminded me of it. It's more so just an interesting update. So whenever you're done with your updates. I'm, I'm ready. Go. I don't know if you saw, Scott, but PlayStation has rolled out their PlayStation View nationwide so pretty much what that allows people to do is you can get over a hundred cable channels for as cheap as forty five dollars a month and it includes uh, DVR cloud-based DVR service so that's another hit to, as you mentioned the cable companies and that's a big hit and the channels they include are the ESPN's the E's the Bravo's some sports networks that cable channels don't have so I think that's really big news Oh, yeah, that is a big definitely. hit, yeah. I'm, I might run out and get one now. Um, you can also use it on your Amazon Fire TV. Oh, I, I, well, I don't have a stick, but I do have Amazon TV. I'm not impressed with Amazon TV. But anyway, um, these are the T-shirts. If, if you guys, you know, I know Eugene knows what they look like, but Dan, that's what they look like. And they are available for purchase on our website. But again, if you, if you, if you tweet or cool. Facebook post this show with Success Hack, the most during the show, you get the T-shirt. It's that simple. It really is. So, Dan. Cool. Good yes. morning. Now, now we get to talk to you. Good morning. Eugene cool. had his long, long-winded intro there. So, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm, um, I'm an award-winning author, speaker, and educator, presently working in Connecticut's largest inner-city high school. And um, written uh, multiple books on multiple subjects, whether it's from education, whether it's from uh, you know evaluation, of professional development, Common Core, or teen leadership. Um, I'm a columnist where I do columns on parenting, teen leadership. Uh, I have one through a, a speaking organization. So you know I'm kind of multifaceted, and I'm involved in a lot of different things. But it ultimately comes down to. I guess one big umbrella of just like uh, you know, like self improvement or self help. I, you know, I'm always out there trying to help whoever I can help with with good advice and maybe some simple strategies. Uh, I'm a lucky man. I've got five kids at home. Uh, you know, even though uh, sometimes they're, they're under my heels and they're not being quiet when I ask them to be quiet and stuff like that. But uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have five kids at home, which is uh, giving me lots and lots of opportunities to not only you know learn more about myself and about children in general but it's given me lots of opportunities to be humbled and I uh, and, and I, I say that uh, in true spirit you know, of, of being a parent and I think that most parents can agree with me on that is that um, parenting you know will definitely humble you and uh, mm -hmm. being a teacher like I am will definitely humble you so uh, I guess, you know, you, you humbly walk through life and you try to learn all you can learn and you try to help whoever you can help. And if you're doing that, then I and then I guess you're doing all right. It's true. Awesome. I've got four of my own, Dan, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I think you saw two of them last night. I don't know if cool. you caught it or not. Yeah, the, that was my oldest and my youngest last night. Yep. Yeah, I heard yeah. them anyways. <laughs> I oh, definitely okay. heard them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the oldest is so pretty that, quiet. Uh, the youngest saying, not so much. 
You remember that old saying uh, from back in the old days when they said kids are, what was that? They're meant to be seen, not heard. Uh, yeah. That doesn't exactly go today. <laughs> no, definitely not. We, we mm -hmm. hear our kids loud and clear today, no doubt. Yes, we do. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, Dan, you have a, a book out called Granddaddy Secrets. What's what's the story behind that? Oh, well, thanks, Gene. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the, the reason I wrote The Granddaddy Secrets, because for about a decade, I had my students telling me that I should write a book so that I could tell other students or other children out there the sort of things that I'm telling them. And, you know, I started thinking that, boy, it's, it's hard enough to get you guys to listen. You know, how am I going to get like other people around the world, other kids around the world to listen? And I really thought about it long and hard. And I was like, all right, so... You know, if it was easy to be successful, you know, whether we're talking about kids or adults, if it was easy to be successful and happy, then everybody would be doing it. So, and everybody's not doing it. So, I guess in a way, it was kind of like, you know, to some people, it's a secret. You know, how do you, what are the secrets to becoming successful and um, happy? And then I started thinking, um, you know, about the whole granddaddy figure and saying that the granddaddy's sort of like, a, you know, a wise older man. Maybe he'll have some secrets that uh, people should be willing to listen, and hopefully kids will be willing to listen. So what I did was I started writing, and I started coming up with some advice that I thought that kids should uh, use in their life to become more successful. And I thought if they became more successful in life, that that would make them happier, and they would be better adjusted kids, and, you know, not so, like, self-centered or uh, the, the things that kids do. You know what I'm saying? They, they think about themselves too much. They don't go out. They don't try to uh, help people all the time. They don't try to, uh, you know, get, get ahead. They, they, they sit there, at least in my experience, you know, they sit there and they wait to be like spoon fed, you know, every single day. I walk into the classroom. I'm like, okay, guys, let's open up your books, take out a pen and paper. And every single day I got kids going, I don't have a pen. And it's like, really? You don't have a pen? I mean, well, you didn't think you were going to need one today? We use a pen every single day, you know? And so I wanted to get, like, kids motivated to, like, do the things that they were supposed to do. So I thought maybe if I could give them some of, you know, granddaddy's secrets, I could motivate them, you know, let them know about some secrets to being more successful and maybe make them, you know, happier, more, better adjusted. And, and you guys know what's happening with the violence in the schools. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just so uncalled for. Uh, out of hand. shouldn't be happening. should not be happening. And if we had kids that were leaders, and that's what I'm focusing on, you know, like making them leaders, team leadership. So if we had kids that were leaders and kids that felt good about themselves, kids that felt like they were improving their lives, then they wouldn't have these insecurities and these, these crazy thoughts of lashing out at others. You know, these crazy thoughts of bullying or even worse, hurting, permanently hurting other kids. And, uh, you know, and if we had kids that were confident, and kids that were leaders, you know, they would stick up for other kids who were uh, being taken advantage of or made fun of or bullied, you know. So that's kind of a, you know, again, it's multifaceted. I'd like to I'd like to attack things from a lot of different angles. But uh, I really feel that I'm making our schools a better place through my teachings and my books and my writings and my speeches and my future webinars I'm going to be putting together. And if I can get these kids you know, the to, to do better, to care more about themselves, to be more successful and more happy. And, you know, the granddaddy secrets is one of the tools that I'm using. If I can get them to do that, then this world is automatically going to be a better place. You know, these kids are going to grow up to become good parents, uh, you know, good citizens, to uh, good neighbors, and, 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 like, most importantly, good parents. And they're going to teach their kids the things that they need to know to be good people. Um, you know, as I told you before, I'm working in the inner city. And and sadly, these kids don't have many role models in the inner city. And and sometimes their parents are overwhelmed and unable to uh, do what they need to do to take care of these kids. You know, and there's lots and lots of reasons for that. But they're they're unable to do what they need to do to, to get these kids to feel good about themselves and be successful. So, you know, in a way, I'm hoping that my granddaddy secrets can be a mentor to these type of kids that don't have the solid home life that they need to grow up to be good people. So I know I just, you know, spoke a whole bunch, 
about this, but I feel pretty passionate about what I'm doing, and I feel that I'm making a pretty positive difference in this world. So thank that's, you about that's, that. That's the, that's the important thing, right? The the passion. Yep. Yep. Uh, so so Dan, you have another book that's sort of out, but I, I'm you know I'm probably going to screw this up a little bit, but you're you're renaming it, I believe. So can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I have a, another book. Actually, I've got a couple of them. If you don't mind me backtracking a little bit, Scott, sure, sure. I, I just uh, co-authored a book with the American Federation of Teachers called the uh, Guide, a Teacher's Guide to a Common Core. So oh, that just came out that. last week. I've got one coming out uh, next month on evaluating professional development in the urban school systems, and I've got the one that you're talking about, Scott. That's going to be coming out. Let's say I believe in June. That one's called the Storm. And what it's about, it's about a, a kid that has a pretty stormy life. And he's got a pretty stormy relationship with his dad. And he's got maybe a stormy, at best, if almost non-existent, relationship with his grandfather. And his uh, grandfather comes back into his life and plants some seeds about what it means to be like a real man, you know, a real leader. And it's not, you know, it's not the stuff that the kids are seeing on TV or on social media. It's not the stuff they're seeing in their neighborhoods. And for some of them, you know, it's not even the stuff that they're seeing in their homes. So I tried to get some real advice through this granddaddy um, figure. He's uh, been a central figure to a lot of my books. So he's given some real advice to just, you know, how to be like a real man, you know, how to be a real leader. And, and again, it's, it's stormy. It's definitely a storm, you know, there's there's uh, ups and downs in the book and there's times where the kid would, you know, maybe like to just punch granddaddy in the face, <laughs> like, like kids can get sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I think the kid walks away a better man and uh, with a lot to think about on where his future's going and how to get there. So uh, it's going to be out this summer. I'm really excited about it. It's called The Storm. I think it's going to be a great book. You know, I think teens should pick it up, and I think anybody who uh, is caring for teens, you know, whether it's their parents, their teachers, their coaches, social workers, or, you know, whoever it may be that's caring for teens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Boy Scout leaders, whatever, they should pick up the book also. There's some great, great insight uh, in the storm that's going to really help people think about, you know, where what their life is, where it's going, and how they can improve the quality of their life and how they can improve the quality of health that they're able to give others. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Great. So, as you just mentioned, you, you co-authored a book about Common Core. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and how you feel about the controversial topic known as Common Core? Uh, yeah, sure, that'd be great, Gene. Um, thank you for asking that question, because that's a good one, because Common Core has been so controversial, mm -hmm. and I've done a lot of um, interviews over the last year on the Common Core. And uh, I started writing this book, you know, about a little over a year ago. And, you know, I didn't fully agree with the Common Core, but if the Common Core was going to be around, what I wanted to do was I wanted to provide teachers with a simple way of understanding the Common Core, some practical tools that they could use to make it easier to deal with the Common Core. And not only easier to deal with the Common Core, but easier to deal with the Common Core while they're not only teaching let's say, mainstream, regular education students. But as you know, as a lot of people may know now, our, our classes are, are way more integrated than they've ever been. And in our regular education classrooms, teachers are facing challenges maybe greater than they've ever faced before with the special education students that are now in their classrooms and with the English language learner students that are in their classrooms. So, you know, thinking that the Common Core wasn't going to go away, at least anytime soon, I co-authored this book, uh, a, a Teacher's Guide to the Common Core, with the American Federation of Teacher to make it easier on uh, mainstream teachers uh, when they're faced with all those difficulties in their classrooms, uh, you know, in dealing with Common Core and writing lesson plans. Now, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, Gene and Scott, I mean, Common Core, when you, when you really break it down to the nuts and bolts of Common Core, Common Core is really not the problem. I mean, Common Core is just saying, okay, what is good teaching? What does good teaching look like? You know, how do you do that? You know, basically, what is good teaching and what is good learning? And we've been doing that for as long as we've been educating students. 
we've been doing good teaching and learning. So that's not the problem. I mean, good teaching is good teaching. We've been doing it forever. That's not the problem. What the problem with Common Core has been has been the application of Common Core and the way that they, they, they made it so difficult, the way they made it so complicated that they had veteran teachers, expert teachers, teachers of all kinds, shapes, and sizes back on their heels saying, okay, how do I do this? And when, when I'm being evaluated, am I using the right words? Should I have said mission instead of objective this time? Or was that last week that I was supposed to say mission instead of objective? Is this week of the word objective instead of mission? I mean, when you got teachers so worried about splitting the hairs, about the delivery, you know, of their content, and they're being scrutinized, you know, and, and they've got paperwork that's, that's piled up higher than their desk, and it's keeping them from doing good teaching. And, and, and you get these student test scores, and you get these crazy evaluations, you know, that, that are also relying partially on the test scores of these standardized tests that really only teach kids one thing, you know, how to take standardized tests. That's all it is. So you've got all these things going on, and you've got teachers that are not able to confidently get in the trenches and teach to the best of their ability. That's the problem. That's the problem when you take effective teachers and you start making them ineffective because you want to weed out, let's say, a couple teachers that may not be getting the job done. Well, you know, if anybody knows the bell-shaped curve, you know, you've got great teachers or great professionals in every profession. Uh, you know, you got mm -hmm. middle of the road and you got poor ones in every profession. <clears throat> so why throw out the baby with the bathwater? You know, why drag down our whole educational system by making the Common Core application so complex that great teachers can't be great teachers anymore and good teachers are not even good teachers anymore, but struggling. And it feels like everyone's struggling. That's not good teaching. That's not good learning. And that's unfortunately where our educational system has been driven into through this application of Common Core. So, you know, things are, the pendulum is slowly starting to swing back. And I, I think that you're going to see the application of this Common Core loosening up and it not being so overly complicated anymore. And then hopefully we can get back to just some common sense, good teaching and learning. Because, um, you know, we've done that all for the history of time. There's been good teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So why are we going to start screwing with that and messing that up now by making it so complicated? It's not that complicated. You know what I'm saying? Let's just get back to just common sense, good teaching and learning. So I think that's where we're going. Uh, hopefully, I think, hopefully we go there quickly, and people don't drag their heels on this too much. But but we'll see. You know, there's always people that want to justify their positions through complicating everything that falls below them. So we'll see where it goes. But like I said, Common Core is is not the big big problem that people think it is. It's really the application of Common Core, and I'm hoping that if people can, um, you know, find my book, and uh, it's it can be downloaded for free, they can go on the American Federation of Teachers website, I would say specifically even the Connecticut American Federation of Teachers website, and there's some great strategies in there and tools in there to um, use Common Core in a simplified, common sense way. So that's, you know, that's my thoughts on Common Core. It's not the uh, Common Core, it's the application of it that's the problem. That was a good question, Gene. Thank you. Awesome, awesome answer, Gene. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes have good questions. Awesome answer, though, because uh, you know, coming from the the parent standpoint, yeah. there's a lot of parents that are up in arms because they have no idea what what to do with it either. So. Yeah, and, and Scott, I got to tell you, it drives me crazy when I think about our educational system taking our parents out of the equation. Exactly. You now they're supposed to be that homeschool connection. Mm -hmm. And when you send kids home with work that the parents can't figure out, you're essentially eliminating that help. Right. And, like, why would you do that? Why would you take the parents out of the equation? And, you know, over the last several years, you know, math has been one of the biggest culprits. When you send math home, 
And and the, and the parents are sitting there trying to show the kids, okay, this is how you do it. And the kids are going, no, 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 we can't do it that way. You know, the teacher said we got to do this other way. And parents are sitting there scratching their head going, what is that? I've never even seen that before. And the parents are like walking away going, I can't help you with your math. And I think that that's crazy. You don't ever, ever take the parents out of the equation. You know what I'm saying? The kids that are the ones that are most mm -hmm. successful are the ones that have a solid base at home and the ones that are getting help, you know, at home. So you don't, you don't take the parents mm -hmm. out of the equation. So I, I feel your pain. Um, you know, I feel my wife's pain because she's home, you know, more than I am when the kids are doing the homework because I'm usually home a little bit later. And lots of times, like, my wife has to wait for me to get home. And she's like, you know, she's like, damn, we got this crazy homework. Can you take a look at it? And I'm, and I'm looking at it going, oh, yeah. All right, here, let me tell you how to do that. You know, but that's because I'm teaching. I'm seeing some of this craziness, <laughs> but the parents aren't. So how are the parents supposed to help when they're not seeing this craziness? You know what I'm saying? So let's get, again, it kind of goes right back to what I just said, Scott and Gene. You know, let's just go back to some common sense, good old-fashioned teaching and learning. And don't ever take the parents. Don't ever complicate it to the point where you're taking the parents out of that equation. Kids need the parents' help. So don't right. remove the parents from the equation. Right, exactly. So, um, a little lighter subject, maybe. I don't know, depending on, on the person listening. For many people, the fear of speaking in public is bigger than the fear of death. I read once that uh, it is the number one fear, and the fear of death is like number six or something. But but you are a keynote speaker. Uh, tell us about some of those speaking events and, and some of those topics that you speak about. All right, great. Thanks again, Scott. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, I always... Um, get a kick out of that when people say that they'd rather drown or be burnt in a fire than speak. Uh, and I'm always thinking I'd never want to drown or get burnt in a exactly. fire. I'd rather speak, but that doesn't mean that I'd rather, you know, that I don't get butterflies. You know, I, I always get butterflies when I go out there and speak. And I think one of the best things you can do, which may be one of the hardest things to do is I think that if you're going to speak out there, then you need to speak about something that you really know right. and something you really care about and something you're really passionate about. And for me, that's been helping teens. And, and, and so how do I help teens? I talk about the struggles that I have gone through and what I've learned. So if I talk about myself, you know, it's a little bit easier because I know. I know myself. You know, I know the struggles that I've been through. So the majority of my talks are – you know, basically, you know, this happened to me, that happened to me, this is what I learned, and, you know, here's a shortcut for you guys. I mean, you guys could try this. And, you know, and I speak in front of teens. Um, I love I, I love looking out there, Scott, and seeing teens on the edge of their seats waiting to, to hear what I'm going to say next. You know, I love when I can hear a pin drop in there, and I just totally have their attention. But I don't only just talk to teens. I have a couple talks where I do for teachers. And some of the talks I do for teachers is, um, you know, becoming more successful when uh, teaching or dealing with uh, difficult students. And today's students are, are more difficult than ever, especially in the inner city. And teachers are feeling more pain than ever in trying to uh, teach these students that are completely different than what they were when they were growing up. So I have a great talk for that. And, I, you know, I get a lot of teachers coming up to me. After saying, you know, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the talk. I learned some great things from you. I'm going to try some of these things in my classroom, you know. And one of the, you know, one of the best things is just for the teachers out there that may be listening, just try to make your class, you know, a little bit more fun. Work on the environment and the climate in your classroom. And if you ever hear me speak, you'll, you'll, you'll learn a lot. I'll give you a lot of tips and a lot of strategies to do that. And then I've also, Scott, given speeches to, like, business owners, business leaders, and, again, it's like a leadership speech. And, again, that whole thing is about, you know, basically it's, it's similar in some ways to what I do to my teens about, you know, sticking it out there. You know, I don't know. Some of you may know this. I'm a double veteran of the United States military, our Army Infantry and an Air Force. And, you know, the Army Infantry is similar to the Marines. You know, they always talk about showing up first, you know, and going home last. You know, and when you're a business leader or a business mm -hmm. owner, you know, these are some of the things that you need to have, you need to know, you need to practice. Is you, you know, you need to show up first. You need to get there early, right? You need to work hard all day, and you need to stay late. 
and do what you got to do. You know, you need to be a self-starter. You need to improvise. You know, you need to look for out-of-the-box creative solutions. You know, and these are a lot of the things I talk about to, like, business owners and business leaders when I give that kind of talk. So I've been very fortunate to be able to speak to teens, be able to speak to teachers or educators, be able to speak to adults, uh, you know, business owners, business leaders. And even, uh, you know, I have a speech that I give for the medical community. Uh, you know, my mom was a nurse. So I have, uh, you know, some great, great stories and experiences about what it was like to grow up as a sickly child with a nurse for a mom. And, um, you know, it was some great, great stories there that I think share some great insight with the medical community. So, uh, again, I mean, I love doing these things because, to me, I feel like I'm sharing part of myself. And I know, you know, what do you know better than yourself? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I get, I get butterflies like everybody else, but I get up there and I give a talk that's good and a talk that's passionate and a talk that's coming from my heart. And, uh, and and people, you know, they really like that sort of thing. And and then at the end, mm-hmm. you know, I get a lot of smiles, a lot of handshakes, a lot of congratulations, a lot of thank yous. So to me, speaking is awesome. I love speaking, you know, and, and I get a little bit nervous, like I said, but that's how it was like when I was an athlete. You know, when I played football, you get those butterflies and you get that first hit, you know, and then you're good. You know, when mm-hmm. I was on the wrestling mat. You know, you get those little, little butterflies, you get whistle blows, and you lock up, and you start tumbling, and, you know, and then the, the butterflies start disappearing, right? It's the same sort of thing. You know, I had lots of practice as an athlete, and it's the same sort of thing with um, public speaking or professional speaking. You get the butterflies, but you get out there, and you start delivering that great speech and that great message that you know is going to help people, and then you, and you see their faces, and you see that they're sucking it up, and they're loving it, and they're craving more, and I got to tell you, I mean, what's better than that? You know, what's better than that when you know you're positively influencing uh, somebody's life? And, and uh, who knows how many people, they're going to go away and positively influence. So I would say if you've ever thought about possibly speaking in front of a group, I would say give it a shot. You might be surprised. You might you might like it. All right, so that's a great subject, uh, Scott. Thanks for asking that question. No problem. I, I love speaking. I know Eugene does too, so... Uh, it's not, you know, I, I definitely fear death over, over speaking, but, uh, you know, I was going <laughs> to yeah, point I out, too. I was yeah. going to point out though, that, you know, when you and I are still working at 1130 at night, Eugene is playing soccer. So I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I do wow. want to remind everybody that you can win a t-shirt today. If you just share the show link while it's live, you can win one of these t-shirts of the person who does it the most with the hashtag success hack, uh, wins the t-shirt. It's that easy. It's uh, and if you don't want to play, if you don't want to p- play to to win the T-shirt, then you could also pay to win the T-shirt. Uh, cost you a little more, but go to growthsuccessradio.com. Yeah. All right. So, so then, what did it take to get your book published? And what would you tell somebody that wants to write a book and get their book? You, you know, Jim, that is such a great question. That has been such a journey for me. Uh, as I told you, I mean, years ago, I, had a, I spent about a decade of my students telling me that I should write a book so that I could tell other kids what, you know, the kind of things that I tell them. And I, and I kept saying, no, 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 thank you. That, that's good. I'm good. And uh, for about a decade, I, I fought it. But then after about a decade, I said, you know, maybe my students are seeing something that I'm not seeing. And maybe I should write a book. So I thought about it. I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book, and when I write that book, I have no idea how I'm going to get it published, so I'm going to have to do research of publishing as I'm writing a book. And I figured, worst case scenario, uh, I could always just write a book and just make it available for my students, you know, maybe print it out and just bring it in as a hard copy and have it in my classroom available for my students. And if one kid picked it up and read it and it made one kid's life better, then that was good. I did good. And I'd be, you know, I'd be rewarded for whatever, just knowing that I made the difference in one kid's life. So as I'm uh, writing this book and researching how to publish it, one of the things that I find is um, that I could put it up on the Internet. So now maybe more kids than just my students would have access to it. And I figured I would just put it there for free and just let kids read it. 
And then I found this thing on some kind of like ebook store. So I considered trying to go that way and I was trying to learn how to put it up on an ebook store and just give it away for free. You know, because I figured if it made a difference in kids' lives and it and it, that would be that'd be cool. And if it took off and it was going you know, like crazy, then and maybe at some point then I would try to sell it. So as I'm doing this, I said, you know what though? You know, in my book, I'm trying to teach kids to swing for the fence. And I'm always telling my students to swing for the fence. So I'm like, I got to swing for the fence at least once. So what I do is, you know, I package it up and I send it off to a traditional publisher that I find on the Internet. I send it off to them thinking nothing will come of this. And I'm just going to probably go Internet to do this thing. A few weeks later, I get a response back from this traditional publisher saying they like the book. They're going to publish it. And I'm thinking, hey, you know, that's awesome. I couldn't believe I hit a home run. So the book got published. And then... You know, I spent the next year or two working with this publisher to slowly find out that they didn't want to work with me. Uh, they doubled the price of my book. They did all sorts of things to make it really difficult for me to get any sales, uh, made it difficult for me to even get my own book. You know, they, they wouldn't, like, accept my phone calls most of the time. It was crazy, and I slowly, slowly started finding out that this – so-called traditional publisher was a vanity publisher. And, uh, and, it, and I got fooled because most vanity publishers charge you a couple thousand dollars to, uh, to uh, publish your book. And these guys didn't. They didn't charge me anything. So they certainly looked like a traditional publisher, but I found out they were vanity. From there, I joined CAPA, which is the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association. And I said, all right, you know, it's not enough to learn how to write a book. That's just the starting point. I now have to learn how to learn about publishing. So, you know, and I had a steep learning curve. So with the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, I learned about publishing. And I started learning about all the mistakes that I had made. And, and then I wrote my second book. And I put that one out. And I self-published that one. And as I, which anybody can do now with CreateSpace and with Amazon, uh, pretty much anybody can self-publish. And self-publish is really growing in popularity and, this, and the, it's not stigmatized the way it used to be. So I would tell people, if you've got something in you that you want to share, don't be afraid to self-publish. However, even with all that I'd learned, Gina Scott, from CAPA, which is the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, I still made a whole myriad of mistakes. And as I'm learning more and more from the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association, and these, you know, this association's in pretty much every state out there. So no matter where you live across the United States, you know, just look for some publishing association in your state, and you can get help on learning how to publish. Whether you're going to self-publish or whether you're going to go the traditional publisher or some kind of hybrid, you know, you're going to learn all this stuff that's going to help you not to make the mistakes that I have made. So as I've learned more and more and put out another book, with each book I've made less mistakes. Uh, with each book I've gotten more help. You know, it took me a long, long time to bite the bullet and to finally hire an editor. But i got to tell you, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And I say, if anybody out there is writing a book, don't waste five, six, seven years like I did, you know, thinking that you can do it all on your own. You're going to have to bite the bullet. You're going to have to spend a little bit of money. You're going to have to hire somebody. And I'd say, you know, probably that first person that you should hire should be an editor. You know, and, and, and that doesn't mean your buddy that's an English teacher. It doesn't mean your, your sister-in-law who, uh, you know, who's got an eye for catching things. You know, it doesn't mean the person down the street who reads and writes like crazy. I'm talking about a real professional editor, somebody that you can sit down with like I did for the storm, which will be coming out this summer. Sit down with them and discuss every single page, every single paragraph, every single sentence, and say, what exactly are you trying to say here? What is the message that you want people to take away? Okay, is there a better way of saying it? And if there is a better way of saying it, let's say it that way. You know what I'm saying? So if my editor, uh, Valerie Arton, has been wonderful. She uh, has gotten me to think deeper 
and deeper and deeper about my book, deeper than I ever thought was possible. She's got me to think about my book and has brought out, you know, the best in me through my speaking and writing. And, uh, you know, nobody of mine could have done that. You know, you need like a true professional to do that. And I understand that people say, well, I don't want to spend the money to do it. Trust me, I get that. I don't want to spend the money to do it. But, uh, but if you really, really want the best product that you can get and you want to publish the best book you can publish, regardless of whether it's self-published, traditionally published, or hybrid, you better get a public, an, an editor because the editor will help you. And, um, you know, and then there's others. There's others that can help you also. So, um, you know, I don't want to go into it because I was sitting there talking all day long. But what I am saying is that if you've got something in you that you think you need to share with the world, don't be afraid to do it. You know, get out there, share it with the world, world but just realize that you're going to need some professional help to bring out what you're really trying to say. And the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association or some other publishing association or the new uh, APSS apps, which is the Association of Publishers for Special Sales with Brian Judd as the national director, they too can help you learn a ton that you're not going to learn on your own and help you put out a way better product and a way better message of what you're really trying to say but don't always know how to get out clearly in a way that people understand what you're trying to say. I mean, you understand it because you know the story. But people who don't know your story and don't have your experience are not going to clearly understand it like you understand it. So you need to find a way to get that out there to people. And the way to do that is you, know, you need to surround yourself with people that know how to do that. So please, join Connecticut Authors Publishers Association or something similar to that. And you can put out a good product, whichever way you go, you know, whether you self-publish, traditional publish, or hybrid publish. All right, so thanks. I, I, I really like enjoy sharing that because I hate to see people spend like five, six, seven years what I did just stumbling. But, hey, when you stumble and fall, you learn, right? So I got to be grateful about that. Yep, good advice. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Um. Dan, you also teach in a fair, you mentioned, you touched on it slightly, but you teach in a fairly tough public school system. Why do you think you have success where other teachers may not? You know, I get asked that question a lot, Scott, and I've had a lot, a lot of success in some of the most difficult classrooms that one can imagine. You know, I work in the inner city. I've worked with special education regular education students that are struggling, maybe that haven't been identified, uh, English language learners. I've worked with all types, autism, uh, socially, emotionally, uh, maladjusted, behavioral, you name it. I've worked with all of them. And, and I got I to gotta believe, I mean, I was asked this question years ago when I didn't quite know how to explain it. And, and this veteran teacher who was retiring, came to me one day and he said, Dan, I want to know what your secret is. And when I didn't really know how to explain it yet, I said, I guess it's my personality. You know, and he laughed and it's like, okay, so what good is that? How is that going to help anybody? Right? And I didn't know how to explain it. But now all these years later, I've got a little better idea of how to explain it. And believe it or not, personality kind of fits in there. I, but now I know how to explain it is, the key to working with difficult students is you have to develop relationships with them. You have to develop a rapport. Mm -hmm. You have to create a climate where the kids feel safe and loved. And when you create that climate, which I was easily able to do, uh -oh. Uh-oh. I think we lost our climates. It's that damn climate change. Yep. Damn El Nino. All right. Uh, okay. So we looks like we lost our, our guest, Dan, here. Yep, we did. My early years. Uh, he's still on, yep. but it's not. he's not in the – let me unlock it here. Hang on.
Looks like he's out of the room for me, too. It's just Mine two people three. in here. One of us is wrong, <laughs> Eugene. Um, no, I know so Dan right. does teach in a, in a public school system. I know it's hard for some people to believe this if you don't live in Connecticut, but Connecticut is some of the worst cities in the country. And um, yeah, he's well, not in the big three, but he's in one of the smaller ones. And um, it's, that one's not much better. Uh, and I think he said it's the largest public high school in the state, which I didn't know. Yeah, no, I had a, one of my close friends is a teacher in New Haven public school system. And he pretty much says the same thing that Dan just says, that you have to just build a relationship with them as soon as possible and establish that rapport so that they, right. they trust you. And because if not, they'll just take over the classroom and you're done. Yep. That's it. Um, we had, I think what, we had three questions left for him. How many degrees? Degrees you have, Dan, um, which is which is a lot. How many? I think it was seven. How many does he have? He, I think it was seven. Yeah, I think so. Seven degrees. Not black belt stuff. Seven, just seven degrees. Um, Still. I don't know who his role model is. I'm just going to say it's me. And then we were we were going to ask what's next Obviously. for Dan. So I know Dan is is trying to uh, get back on the speaker's trail. Um, and then of course the book comes out. So that means he will be speaking for sure. And then we had our fire round, of course. Right. So I'm going to ask you these questions, Eugene. How about that? What was your favorite subject in high school? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was mine too. Math. What was your least favorite? Mm -hmm. Science. History. Science or history? Yeah. History was probably history. Too. So we have, we have some history. common ground here. Look at this. If you had to go through high school all over again, what would you do differently? That's a good one. I think I'd probably play more sports and work less. Like a job less? Yeah. That's yeah. a good one. I did work a lot myself. What were we thinking? Jesus. That's what happened. I worked like yeah, almost 30 hours That's a week. what happens when you grow up in New Haven. you got to get a job. Um... And then, if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would it be? Don't say bad. Bora Bora. Bora Bora. I wasn't expecting that one. I'd go. Yeah, me too. I want to be on a beach or on my, on my over-the-water bungalow. Well, I don't know about over-the-water, but I'd be, I'd be close. Maybe walking distance to the water. Yeah, so that's all we had for Dan. Huh? Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe back to Haiti. Somewhere in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, so, Eugene, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you on again. You know, This is 27 Likewise. times now we've been on together. Maybe more than that. I don't even know. But this was episode 27, so... More than that. That's I know, crazy. it goes fast. We're times. already more than halfway to 50. We're approaching my age. Too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For those of you don't, for those of you that That's don't know, Eugene is a vampire. Uh, we do. We we have a guest to be determined next week, 10 a.m. Friday. We'll be here. Blab. Dot I am slash Scott Gumbar for another episode of Grow Success Radio. It'll be episode 28. Uh, we encourage everybody to come back, join us, and, uh, you know, win a T-shirt or something. And maybe we'll be giving something else away next week, depending on the guest. Um, until then, everybody have a good Easter weekend. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Yeah. Eugene, any parting thoughts? April 8th, I will be doing the show from San Diego. I thought Diego. you were going to say Bora Bora. San Diego, huh? What's what? What's in San Diego? <laughs> I wish. It's um. Well, that weekend is our oh. one-year wedding anniversary, and my cousin lives in San Diego. So it's, let's just take a trip Can't out to California. It's already a year. Yeah, April tenth. Wow. I should remember that really because April 9th right. is my birthday. Yeah. There you go. 
I'll have a drink for you on the main. I'll have two for you on the tent. How about okay. that? I get you some. I get you some sweet potato Deal. cookies, which, by the way, are unbelievable. I told you, right? Oh, you wouldn't so think of good. it, but they're so good. All righty. I will uh, see you later, Eugene. All right. All right, thank you.